Tonight we're in Weymouth. Welcome to Question Time. On tonight's panel, George Eustace, appointed a week ago as Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, but an old hand at the department where he's been a minister since 2013. Alison McGovern, a Labour MP since 2010. She served under Gordon Brown and Ed Miliband and chairs the Labour group Progress, originally founded to support Tony Blair. Chairman of the Royal Bank of Scotland, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England and the first chair of the Financial Advisory Authority, Howard Davis. Ash Sarkar, journalist, activist and contributing editor at left-wing online publication Novara Media. And broadcaster, commentator, former Conservative politician and train geek, Michael Portillo. to our panel, to our audience here, and of course, as always, to you at home, and you can join in the conversation on social media at BBC Question Time. Right, we're going to start tonight not with one question, but with two. So can we hear, please, from Susanna Bell and Lee Andrade. Could you please explain to me, a community nurse, how chronic understaffing in social care will be tackled given the government's new immigration system? And Lee? Uh, hoteliers struggle all year to staff permanent positions. Who will we recruit into the seasonal positions that are traditionally filled by the EU citizens? So obviously this is a response from both of you to the immigration proposals that we've had this week. Uh, Alison. Well, I think the thing about these migration proposals that we've had from the Tories demonstrate two things. Firstly, that the Tories define a person's worth, the value of their work, by money which I think is interesting given how hard some people, particularly in social care, but in other aspects like retail and hospitality work. The other thing I find absolutely mystifying about this is that I thought that Boris Johnson and his uh, friends in the cabinet were free marketers. I thought they believed in the free market. But actually this immigration system is going to be really bureaucratic. So I think that actually it's gonna be much more complex for people. And I do think that we're going to end up in particular areas like those that have been mentioned with significant challenges and shortages. The one thing that I hope comes out of it all, though, is that for those people who do work in social care, that we work out a way through this to pay those people some more. And because it's one of the hardest jobs in this country. And I am sick to death of people who work in social care being on poverty pay. And <laughs> And do you support the Labour position that was voted at the party conference that there should be freedom of movement? I think freedom of movement was a good thing. You know, okay. I, I, I think that the single market works because it gives everybody a chance and an opportunity to learn around the continent of Europe and, and to work. Okay. Michael Portillo. Uh, well, I think it's extremely important that we should not have shortages in the health service, in care homes and in hotels. And I think the government is going to have to show a certain amount of flexibility. There are some dangers, I think, in the new immigration policy. And that's why they've said that they're going to have to adapt to what actually happens. I do think, though, we've got ourselves into a rather unhealthy position nationally where we assume that care workers and health workers are going to come from other countries and probably not stay very long and probably not move up through the system and not be promoted to senior positions. And in hotels as well. Uh, and restaurants, only a very small number of the people who go in as waiters and so on, uh, uh, as chambermaids, have the opportunity to be promoted. And I think we ought to get back to a situation where more British people see the care industry, the National Health Service, uh, catering, hotels, see these as careers, uh, uh, go to them because they want to go to these jobs, um, have the proper qualifications, uh, have training and have the opportunity to move up through the system. I think there's something rather decadent about the situation that we've got into, where we think there are lots of jobs that only foreigners, and probably rather transitory foreigners at that, will do. Uh, and I rather join with Alison in thinking that one of the consequences of this may be that we'll have people who are very committed, uh, who've decided that it's what they want to do for their lifetime, and certainly, therefore, who are going to be uh, better paid. 
So I think the consequences of this immigration policy are are pretty broad, and and, and I you think talked actually about pretty dangers. positive. What, what, but you said you could see dangers. Well, what are uh, they? The, 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 the danger is the short-term one. That of course, if the policy bites and there are vacancies, then the government's going to okay. have to well, respond quickly. Where, Lee, where are you? Because we were talking about. So, what's your feeling on this? You. I mean, you heard what Michael had to say. Well, I think the care industry and, and the hospitality industry are very different anyway. Um, and I absolutely agree that the, the care industry should be paid a lot more. Um, I wonder about the hospitality industry, though, that we're saying we're, we're giving a double standard there. We're saying they should... should um... Well, Michael's talking about maybe rather than getting people in from, from the rest of the world, why not get British people to do this and train them up? Is that I mean, realistic we, as far as you're concerned? No, I mean, we, we are constantly looking for staff. All the way through the year, we're constantly looking for staff. The bulk of our staff come from the European Union for mostly for the seasonal work because we cannot get staff any other way. And why, it's why, why do you think British people aren't going for it? <sighs> Uh, well, firstly, they, they worry about what they're going to do out of season. So if they were only employed for eight months of the year, what will they do for the next four months of the year? Um, so that's obviously a concern. You couldn't employ them all year round because you don't have the business for them all year round. But I do worry about um, having a double standard where you say that you want to see people come into the, the hospitality industry and be treated as professionals and look to go forwards. But then on the other hand, you say this is unskilled work it's cheap labour coming in to do it, which doesn't paint a picture of professionalism or, or, or a job that people might want to go into. So. so, George, I mean, since these immigration proposals were, were, were mooted by the Home Secretary, there's been a, a fair degree of outcry from, from a number of sectors, not least the hospitality industry and, and uh, the social care sector. I mean, how much of these proposals are actually going to stay? As well, is. I think the important thing to remember is as we leave the European Union, we've got a chance to uh, do things differently and to have an independent uh, immigration policy. And rather than uh, simply having free movement with European countries, um, we've got a chance to say uh, we're going to have a skills-based immigration system and not decide on allowing people free movement just because uh, they're European, uh, but to actually have people with the right skills from around the world. And in terms of the sectors that, that have been mentioned, it's important to recognise that the uh, EU um, citizens that are here now working in those industries can stay. And in fact, over three yes, million... You know, you know that there's uh, unemployment in the social care sector, <laughs> there's jobs that can't be filled in the hospitality sector. So, Yes, but we, we need to try to, uh, you know, wean ourselves off this, you know, constant pipe stream of uh, people coming uh, from other countries. And there are industries that could uh, automate more to um, replace some of those jobs. Admittedly, what, not, not the care sector. No, admittedly, not the care sector. Uh, <laughs> but we also need. So, do you think you're going to have to realistically give some flexibility when no, it comes I, to social I, care? I think the point is I, that I was making is that we've got over three million that have already uh, signed up to um, settle here. So there's a, a lot of uh, EU uh, citizens that are already here working who will stay and can stay. We've also, alongside this, opened a seasonal agricultural workers' scheme for um, 10,000 people. And there are also special provisions for the NHS. There's an NHS visa scheme, and there are ways that people can get points uh, if, they are, if they have less than the threshold well, income. There's, there's lots set. of hands up. Let's hear from the audience. The woman here in the front in the pink. Yes. Um, interesting what you're saying here. 68 million people now live in England going up, UN estimates. At what stage does the panel and people think this country has had enough? That we should close the borders, completely close the borders? Because it's got to the stage now is there's no education, schooling, infrastructure. It's enough. We are sinking. Surely someone's got to see common sense and say enough is enough. You've got people flooding into this country that cannot speak English, I've come from London, in the National Health Service, everything's written in different languages. How much is that costing? How much is it costing much. for yeah. the interpreters? <laughs> Sorry, madam, how much is it costing for the interpreters? I was in hospital last week, the interpreter never turned up for the people who couldn't speak English. She was paid, they all had to go on, and all the radiologists stood around doing nothing. What sort of country is allowing this? What sort of country is allowing this tourism to come in? You arrive in a plane, you get free service, you can have your babies, you can just carry on having it all for free. Why haven't they got points set up in the hospitals and you pay like you do in every other country you go to. You wouldn't okay. turn up in America let, let's and let be allowed panel, to go for free. Let's let the panel answer some of those points. 
strongly made. Ash. Well, one thing is, I wouldn't presume to know what kind of nonsense I get up to in America, but that's another story. On this matter of health tourism, what has been found is that migrants to this country mm -hmm. bring more and contribute more in tax than they take out of rubbish. the system. No, it's true. It's, it's a fact. Rubbish. It's a fact. Sorry, rubbish. facts don't care about your feelings. It's a fact. is that migrants, particularly when they're young, their working age, they're contributing to the private sector through the form of paying rent, through paying for their cost of living in this country, and they're also contributing to this country through taxes. When it comes to uh, Britain, we have an ageing population. So you've got more and more people who will age out of the workforce. And at the moment, with our birth rates, we don't have enough people ageing into the workforce to be able to support the kind of social care and pensions needs which are only going to grow. But one thing that I really want to say, because this is really okay. important, to me is I don't want to just make the case for migration on GDP and the labour force. I want to make the human case for it. My grandmother came to this country, she was 17, and it was to fill a gap in the labour market which still exists, which was for social care. Under these rules, she wouldn't have been able to come to this country. She wouldn't have been able to meet my grandfather, fall in love, have children, have some grandchildren. I know not many of you will agree that all of her grandchildren were a good okay. idea, but you know, we exist. Okay. But, uh, and that's a human briefly, story briefly, yeah. that's got worth and it's got a value which cannot be measured merely in GDP. I understand that, but why would you give preference to European countries uh, over, over other countries in the so world? So I think this is the point. You should have a, uh, a system that is around the people uh, that you uh, need, the skill shortages you have, not about um, the fact okay. that they're Absolutely. European countries. Here, here, here are two things which are good about this policy, and you'll never hear me praising a Tory government. It's getting rid of the £30,000 threshold, which was completely uh, bonkers, and the arbitrary cap. However, I don't believe that by making conditions worse for EU nationals, you are actually making them better for non-EU okay. nationals. There's it's lots a of hands up, and I'd like to get around a little bit more of the audience. Yes, the woman in the black and white top there. Oh, hello, yes. Getting back to your previous comment about um, why do these people not stay in the jobs, I think it boils down to the fact that we don't value enough of our own people and pay them enough and value them <laughs> much more strongly. So why should we redeem a, a foreigner would do a job? Because they're paid less. It's absolutely outrageous. We need to address the social care crisis anyway, and I think we must start with valuing them more and pay them well. The man in the orange cup. Yes, thank yes. you. Yeah, um, any illusion that Boris Johnson might have been a bit neutered after his uh, election win has kind of gone out the window. Um, it's nationalism to me. It's picking someone over, I don't know, a bit of land they were born on, if they've got the skills, give them a chance to move on up. It's, it just seems a little bit worrying. I mean, it's kind of not really the Brexit dream of 350 million, the utopia. It's, not, it's kind of a first realistic, grim step, I think, that's going to be a bit of a scary wake-up call. And, and people might have a few regrets. You know? OK. Are the woman with the glasses, then? Um, how are care homes going to be able to manage, to be able to pay workers, care workers, higher wages, when they are short of money, lots of care homes are closing anyhow, um, surely that's going to be a huge problem in the future. Well, actually, Suzanne, can we just hear from you on this? Because you, you raised this point. What, what's your particular concern? Because well, you work in the social care sector. I do. I'm a community nurse. I work with um, district nursing, caring for these people that require social care. 12% of the health and social care workforce are foreign nationals. We couldn't function without them. And so discouraging them from coming to work in social care is just going to cause the social care system to collapse even further than it already has. And it's just a scary thought that people like myself are going to be picking up the mess of these people that are going to become ill and not have the care that they need. I mean, how, I'm going to come to you in a minute, I realise you haven't spoken yet, but George, I just want to put that point to you, because well, provision... Was here. No, no, I haven't forgotten <laughs> you here, but provision was made to allow in-care workers in the previous immigration bill, which was just over a year ago. That's been dropped now. Did it matter then, but it doesn't matter now? No, I think the point is, as I said, that the, um, the, the three million or so that are here are staying, and so they can stay in those roles. But as, Michael said, well, as Michael said earlier, we have to um, basically start training our own workforce in these areas and value uh, some of these uh, careers and these jobs more. And um, I think we can do that. And we do need to, to start training and uh, having um, <clears throat> our own homegrown talent in these areas. I mean, we've got nearly full employment, haven't we? Do you think, are you confident, I mean, you know about business, are you confident we're going to find these people? 
Um, not, not in the particular areas that were created. We do have almost full employment, but speaking from the perspective of an employer, and obviously employers have been in a dialogue with the government about what its immigration policy should be, bearing in mind the needs of the economy. And I think what they've come up with is in some ways not bad. I agree with Ash about the reduction in the uh, uh, salary. But there are two areas, and you hit on them precisely, the, two, the double question, where I think they've got it wrong. One is social care and the other is hospitality. But I think the solutions are very different in each case. I think in the case of the hospitality, what we need is something like what George referred to about migration, about migrant workers, etc., in agriculture. And I think we probably need something equivalent in hospitality. Because I do know that in certainly in particularly in relatively well-off areas where it's expensive to live, it's actually very difficult to recruit local workers for, for hotels and restaurants and stuff. In social care, I think it's a completely different question. And there, I think, that we are awaiting, and have been for some time, a government policy on social care. Uh, and, of course, there was an attempt at it under the famous Theresa May manifesto, which crashed and burned, if you recall. And, of course, the um, Prime Minister <coughs> said he had a, it was, there was a plan ready to go exactly. when he stood on the steps and of that's the what we need, because the problem is the social care sector is underfunded and as a result there are all sorts of false incentives that the NHS has got an incentive to dump people out of the NHS into social care but social care has got an incentive to dump people back into the NHS particularly older people and this has got to be sorted out and that I don't think is primarily an immigration question at origin it is about how we fund social care so these are the two gaps in the policy but they do need different solutions okay the man there with the glasses <coughs> uh, one of the pitfalls, or the potential pitfalls, or the point system that has been proposed, I think, is um, with regards to the minimum uh, wages scale, uh, which has been uh, pitched at about £25,000, is going to backfire and cause further problems, at least in the healthcare system, because the current salary of the healthcare people uh, is about 16 to 17 thousand pound and if they do not reach that threshold of 25 thousand the re they, they miss uh, 20 points straight away uh, which is going to backfire I think okay and there's a, a man at the back young and guy at the back yes uh, so people coming over into the country uh, looking for jobs in the social care industry like the NHS and the welfare state how can they be ensured that their job is going to pay them well enough because economic conditions like austerity has resulted in people in the NHS leaving, going on strike, not providing care for the people who need it. OK, and there's a woman there with her hand up in the black top. Um, how do you think people feel about being labelled a low-skilled worker? Mm. Yeah, exactly. I think it's divisive. Care is not low-skilled. Care is highly skilled. Highly skilled. It's not paid enough but it is a highly skilled job and I would love the government as part of this to bring forward a proper care workforce plan so that we could see whether we you know of course we want British people to work in the care sector but we want it to be a really good job where people can progress on and be paid enough to feel the dignity and self-respect for doing what is a really highly skilled job. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe in a way to summarise, I, I don't think we should be proud as a country of having run an immigration policy which meant that lots of our vital services have depended on cheap labour coming from outside, which has not only meant that we're dependent on that, but it's also driven down the wages of people in this country. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and this has been happening What's for... What's the evidence for that? Well, it's obvious. If, if you admit a source of people who are willing to come and do jobs that British people are not willing to do at that level of pay, then all pay is going to be dragged down by it. That's and I think... What the data shows is that where there has been a small amount of undercutting is highly I, localised in particular yeah. sectors and particular think, regions. It's not across the entire workforce at all. I think, it's just I think we're I moving... Think, I think, I think, like, we're, I think that Howard and Ash should give you an economic I th seminar. I think we're moving to a position where we will feel greater national dignity because we're not doing that, we're going to be inviting British people to come and be qualified and stay in jobs and feel vocation uh, and really get away from this rather okay. decadent position. Let me, I want to take a question from Jane Edsel. Jane, whereabouts are you? Because that, that addresses this exact point, I think. As an economically inactive person, 
what will entice me to fill the gap left by the exodus of, quote, low-skilled foreigners, unquote? Because you are in the 8.45 million, I think it was 45 million. Eight point, uh, yeah, 8.4, 8. Uh, 8. Yes. Yeah. Uh, cited by the Home yeah. Secretary as, as the workforce we could draw upon. Yeah. Uh, many of those are students, mm. retired, can't be sick, retired. carers. But, but you would count. So what would entice you? To, 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 as, as Michael says, yeah, rather than, than, than delegating this work to, to people I think outside that, our shores. I think that's tricky for me currently. Retired, retired early, but I'm also on the edges of looking at caring for elderly parents. Mm -hmm. So there's the potential that I'm going to be stepping into that arena. So, so could I... you be enticed? Could you be part of this workforce that Michael's calling for? Probably not at the moment, I would say. Um, being on the edges of, as I say, being um, wanting to care for elderly parents or being part of that um, plan, mm. that to me is more important than going out and mm. working and filling some of those gaps. Mm. Maybe others may be enticed to do that, but for me, that, that's not something that I feel able that you know feel able to do. Does it concern you? I mean, when Pretty Patel talked about this eight and a half million, and then has attracted a fair degree of criticism, it's fair to say, since the majority yes. <coughs> of that are people who actually aren't but, available No, no, I think what, the so point what, she was, what was she thinking? Well, I think the point she was making is that there are people that could be drawn from that group, not that uh, all eight million of those people uh, could uh, or even would. Uh, but there will be uh, some students, there will be uh, some you know, older people, for instance, who may go into uh, a caring role and that might work for them, working part-time. So um, the point she was making is that's a group that could be drawn on. But I wanted to touch on a point that the gentleman made earlier as well about the uh, NHS staff and the, the threshold. Um, because the threshold actually um, with NHS staff doesn't apply in quite the same way. So to get the points, there are uh, certain jobs such as nursing, uh, where you can actually come in uh, on the salary significantly below that if you're in one of those occupations where we have a shortage, including the NHS. And of course, we've also got the NHS um, visa system as well. Okay, Karen, very briefly yeah, before they, I move on. We're obviously not going to attract you, the woman in blue, into work. I, mean, uh, I don't think we're Jane. in a position where where we're going to force people to work if they don't want to. But the general answer to your question is we have to have more flexible working so that people can fit it in around caring responsibilities and we have to have more lifetime retraining opportunities so people can retrain. So the Labour okay. manifesto is what you've just said? Uh, OK. <laughs> That's fine. 1983, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on, because there are a lot of you who want to talk about this next subject. Uh, before I do, I'm then going to tell you we're going to be in Middlesbrough next week. Uh, and after that, we'll be in Tunbridge Wells with Labour leadership hopeful Lisa Nandy. So if you'd like to be in the audience, call 0330-123-9988 or go to the Question Time website and you can follow the instructions there. So do come and join us at either of those locations. It would be great to see you. All right, let's take this next question now from Hilary Maxwell. Have we forgotten how to be kind? So, Hilary, you are referring, of course, to the tragic... Uh, death of Caroline Flack. Absolutely. Um, and she, in fact, said on her Insta one of her Instagram posts uh, back in December, I think it was, um, she wrote, in a world where you can be anything, be kind. I mean... <sighs> Ash? So, when I first heard the news about Caroline Flack, like lots of people, I was completely shocked and I was saddened. And then after I was shocked and after I was saddened, I felt in a way, quite deeply angry because I thought that after Amy Winehouse, I thought that after Princess Diana, this tabloid hunger to build up young women in the public eye just to tear them down, that we would have learned something from that. And I know that... Is it just the press, all, do you think? I know that all of us in some way participate in this particular form of you know, media, ecology, all of us do. We use social media, we drive the clicks. But ultimately, I do think that responsibility has to lie with the press. For instance, when it comes to tobacco regulation, you don't just expect smokers to change their behaviour. You expect tobacco companies to be properly re regulated. They're the ones feeding this quite unhealthy addiction. And I think that there's a parallel there with the press. Serving the public interest is not the same thing as you know, meeting this quite ghoulish thirst for details of people's lives that sometimes we just should not have. Mm. I think that there needs to be a better uh, in regulation of the press. I think we might even need Leveson too, so that we can stop having a media which, instead of holding the powerful to account, is simply ruining people's lives for profit. <laughs> 
been, Michael, you've been in public life for quite some time. Um, you've had your fair share of press coverage, some positive, some negative. What's your view? I think my first reflection is that I, I remember a friend of mine committing suicide when I was very young. And uh, when that happens and you were close to the person, you're left with a question for the rest of your life as to, uh, was there anything you could have done? Should you have spotted something? Should you have intervened? And so uh, my sympathy is not only um, with Caroline Flack, but you know, with all those people who may find themselves in that position at the moment of wondering if there was anything they could have done. I, I don't think I do rush to blame someone in this situation um, in the way that I've just heard from Ash. Um, th there's an article, I think, in today's Telegraph about a woman who found herself in the same position that she had been uh, accused of common assault against her partner. And she was talking about her suicidal f feelings before it reached trial. And when it did reach the moment before trial, it was suddenly called off. And this woman was reflecting that she might have taken her own life. And then she found she didn't even have to face the trial. And that is a tragic thought here that, um, you know, Caroline Flack was clearly um, overwhelmed by this feeling about what the trial would be and what it would mean. And, and she can't even have known, you know, what were the prospects that it would even reach court, let alone that it would result in a, uh, an outcome. And I don't think I do blame the um, Crown Prosecution Service because I know they would have been blamed if, uh, if these steps had not been taken because she was a celebrity. Uh, it is standard procedure that they proceed even if the alleged victim doesn't wish to participate because that is very often because the victim feels intimidated. Uh, it's standard procedure, although I think it's a rather cruel one, and I'm not sure that it should be for partners in that situation not to be allowed to communicate. And Caroline Flack, uh, unlike some of the contestants, of course, was a professional. I mean, she, she's been in the public eye for decades. She knows what it is to be. She knew what it was to be in the public eye. And, and, and there is, you know, a thing that happens with uh, famous people, which is that we all love good publicity and we all hate bad publicity. And it is, you know, part of what goes with the territory. So I'm not, I'm not rushing to blame anyone here. OK, there's quite a few hands up. Let's see. It's the man in the blue shirt. Hello. Um... I have a unique perspective on this. I've been a television producer for the last 40 years. And also today is the ninth anniversary of my son's suicide. Oh. He was 24 years old when he took his own life. But I, I know that the press and the media can be really brutal in its ambition. I know that. I've been there. And unfortunately, I've been part of that. And I hold my hand up for that. But also, it can, it can drag in the vulnerable and spit them out. I mean, it, is, it can be very, very brutal. And that's what, that's what I would like to say. In terms of my son's death, there are many complications to, to do with suicide. There are many different reasons. In my son's case, he'd taken a prescription drug for acne and um, he'd become very, very depressed, psychotic, suffered from sexual dysfunction and eventually committed suicide. So I'm desperately sorry for, for your situation and I applaud you actually for coming yeah. along tonight on this anniversary and talking about it. The one thing I'm hearing amongst the many things you're saying is, is how complicated it is. And, and Alison, I'm just thinking that you know, I've been following this story like everybody else. I didn't know Caroline Flack. The, the, the press have come in for an awful lot of criticism, but, but these things, uh, uh, perhaps rightly, but these things can be complex, can't they? They can, and I, I mean, firstly, I would absolutely agree with you, Sarah. I think you're really brave, and, you know, hats off to you, and I applaud you for being frank in the way that you have. I also think of Caroline Flack's family, I think, what, of what they must be going through, and having to deal with this constant attention must be very, very difficult. But I want to go back to the question, which is, have we forgotten mm. how to be kind? And my answer to that is yes and no. Uh, my experience of life is that there's a huge amount of kind people in this country doing their best. And there are lots, of, in lots of ways, as we've heard described, in 
that we're not kind. But there's two answers to that. The first is we can all be responsible for our own choices and we can all choose to be kind to one another, which is what we frankly ought to do. And the second thing is we need to make the system more kind. So we, need, we know we need radical investment in the mental health system in this country, but that goes through every single aspect, whether that's workplace culture to make that more kind, or whether that's the way that the NHS can or can't react to particular conditions, let's make that more kind. Let's make the Department for Work and Pensions and the way that universal credit functions more kind. I think there's lots that we can do, but if the question is, should we have a manifesto for kindness, I say yes, please. Man here in the front. <laughs> I agree with about this thing about being kind and, and, you know, and my condolences to the gentleman over there. The fact is, Caroline Flack was a very, very sad case, you know, and the fact that she's taken her own life is appalling. But we have hundreds and hundreds of veterans who are dying at their own hand every single year. Where's the outcry? Where's the support? So the woman at the back there with... The woman at the back with the white T-shirt, yeah. Kindness comes from all of us. Are we not all guilty of not picking up that phone and talking to someone and just merely sending a text? It means far more if you hear kindness rather than just read it. OK. And the, the woman there in the, in the glasses, yes. Me? Yes. <laughs> well, don't you think... I, I, I'd be the last person to say that the press is exonerated of anything. But on the other hand, if you don't buy those newspapers... And if you don't read those newspapers, they're not going to make the stories. And I think it's up to us to pass by those tabloids and not pay attention to the stories that are in the tabloids. Because we sell those newspapers. Because we buy them. And of course, it's, it's uh, much as the press may or may not have a role to play, of course, there's a role of social media as well, which Ash touched upon, George. Yes, um, <clears throat> and I, I do think, uh, coming back to the original question from uh, Hillary, there's something about social media, in particular Twitter, that there's anonymity. And for some reason, uh, that's developed a culture where people think it's OK to be uh, rude and to be abusive and to be aggressive. And I think we somehow need to try to break that cycle because it's not... Uh, this is a very, very tragic, uh, terrible case. I agree with Michael that it's wrong to point the finger to any, uh, you know, one institution or organisation because this is always... These are always very, very complicated cases. But we have issues in our uh, schools across the country at the moment with teenagers suffering from mental health and depression. Uh, a lot of that is because they're wearing their hearts on their sleeve, seeking validation from, you know, sometimes strangers and um, not always is getting it and getting abuse and everybody's quite exposed and I think this there is this point about trying to get some you know, courtesy and kindness uh, back into our, uh, our discourse and there's something about social media that for some reason uh, means that it's absent quite often. Howard? Yeah I think George is right about social media I've been struck I mean I lead a relatively sheltered life in this respect I mean I'm, I'm on Twitter and this and that but I'm not a big Instagram person but I'm often amazed by the virulence and hostility and anger that people will come out with once they hide behind Cornish George or whatever sort of handle they use. And I think if out of Is this... Is that your handle, George? Uh, <laughs> um, Have you just been outed by Howard? Is that your yeah. I'm, uh, I'm famously not on Twitter. I decided quite early on that it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not for me. It doesn't appeal to me. Hang on, let's hear, what, I, let's hear yes. what Howard has said. Yes. So you can come back in. But if, uh, I mean, if out of this very sad set of circumstances, which I think show how you know, tension can build up in an individual and suddenly they go from being in everybody's eye to being very isolated... Uh, also, what worries me, I mean, Michael may be right not to criticise the, the CPS, but sudden, uh, what's happened to innocent until proved guilty? You know, uh, uh, somehow... Well, are you saying they shouldn't have brought the prosecution? No, I'm not saying that, but I am saying that, as, that when this prosecution was brought, she was dropped from the job, um, she wasn't allowed to see her other half, etc. Well, that's obviously nothing to do with CPS. Isolate. No, that's uh, sorry, I mean, it's not CPS, but mm -hmm. suddenly you're isolated because the assumption is made that this must be, you must have done something wrong. And I think that we've lost that innocent until proved guilty uh, dimension to this, which I think is most unfortunate. But if we do get a better debate about civility 
um, even if we can't get as far as kindness, we could get to civility, we could get back to civility, I think. And if so, that comes out of this, then you know, maybe there'll be something positive from what's a very un unhappy right, situation. Well, let's see if we can do that at least for the rest of the programme, which would, would be good. I think it's been pretty civil so far. Let's take a question now from Carol Burgess. Why has Boris Johnson not reacted to the appalling recent floods and had no COBRA meeting? <laughs> so, George, what, what is going on then? We've had Storm Keir, we've had Storm Dennis, record... Uh, heights in, in rivers such as the River Wye. And we haven't had a peep out of Boris Johnson. Why no Cobra meeting? Well, I have. Um, so when I, know I was, you've been very busy, but well, what about you? <clears throat> when I was appointed uh, uh, last uh, Thursday, the first thing that the Prime Minister said to me uh, is, we've got um, Storm Dennis coming up. We want you to lead on that uh, response. We discussed the uh, possible impacts of Storm Dennis. Uh, we immediately stood up uh, what we have, which is a flood response centre. So uh, that's an equivalent, really, to Cobra that's focused on floods. Um, we had uh, conference calls... But hang on, you've got, you've got a Tory, one of your own MP, saying he was trying for nine days to get, get emergency funding. Call, you've had Tory MPs calling for a Cobra meeting because it gets all the departments together to make a decision together about where the fund is going to go and where the resources are going to go. That's the point of it. There was one um, in, when the general election was going on. There was a COBRA meeting then. Why has there not been one this well, time? Well, because we have the Flood Response Centre and we also have local resilience forums that lead on the ground. But and you look, had we've, those then as well? Uh, yes, so but we've what, had... What's different this time? It's much worse this time. Um, well, what's, uh, the difference this time is we've had two uh, consecutive um, storms uh, in a row, but we were well prepared for them uh, during the election. Uh, paradoxically, because you were in what's called a perda period and ministers weren't in uh, the department, there was a slow start to the response, and that's why uh, the Prime Minister convened COBRA to get it back on track. That's not happened this time. Uh, in fact, we've had a 1,000 Environment Agency staff uh, on the ground. We've laid 5,000 metres of uh, temporary flood defences. We've had 90 pumps moving. We've protected around 25,000 properties uh, over uh, the course of the last week. And on Tuesday, we did stand up a comprehensive package of emergency support uh, with funding for councils, uh, hardship funds for homes that have been flooded, um, suspension of council tax for people who have been affected, business rates relief okay. and other things besides. Uh, how would you... I mean, in terms of Carol's question, yeah. the fact that we've not heard anything from Boris Johnson, I mean, well, he's been... Un Yes, Is it fairly unusually silent? I don't know, but we haven't heard anything be, from Whether it would be useful to have Boris galumphing around in his wellies, I'm well, not no, sure. But, 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 but Carol's um, not saying galumphing around his but you're just saying you haven't heard anything from yeah. him. Yeah. Well... I, I think that uh, what George said is probably fair in terms of what the government have been doing. But I think the reality is that this is all too late and after the event. And I think what we have to realise now in this country is that these incidents of extreme weather conditions, and particularly floods, are what we're going to have to get used to. And I think we're going to have to have, as part of the Green New Deal or whatever we want to call it, we're going to have to have a major programme of investment in protecting ourselves against the implications of climate change and rising sea levels. Sea levels are rising <laughs> three, 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 three millimetres a year, and over time that has an enormous effect. I was talking to a, a, a Dutch economist earlier this week, and I said, well, surely the Dutch must be worried about all of this, given what we've got. And she pointed out that actually in the... 1950s, the Dutch had a terrible series of floods and went in for a major investment programme to protect the Netherlands. Since when, they have not had floods, or very, very tiny, and they are very well protected. And I think this is now to a point where we just have to say that this is, needs a major programme of investment to cope with rising sea levels. And if we don't do that, then we're left with George's emergency measures and sandbags, and I don't think that's going well, to be up it, to it. <coughs> Except can I just come in? So we, 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 we're doing that as well. So in the last five years, we've spent two and a half billion pounds on 600 projects protecting over 200,000 homes, and we're going to spend another four billion pounds over the uh, next five years on flood defences. So. Had we not done the work we've done in the last five years, there would have been another 25,000 homes affected by this uh, most recent event. So in total, um, it'll be 9% of HS2. Good. Well done. Well, it, <coughs> there's a... Um... He's an economist, after all. <laughs> exactly. I'm 
sure his maths are right. But, uh, it's, but he is right that these events, these extreme weather events, are becoming more frequent, sadly. We do need to invest in flood infrastructure. That's not just hard defences in towns. It can also be uh, using floodplains and uh, soft dams and such upstream to try to slow the water flow, and that's something we're looking very closely but, at. But if the, if the government's taking it so seriously, how come <coughs> Boris Johnson hasn't, for instance, responded to the climate emergency that was set by Parliament and the deadline to respond to Parliament within that time frame? How come Claire O'Neill, who was heading up uh, the COP conference, said, you know what, he just doesn't understand climate change and he told me directly that he doesn't understand my job? To me, as an outsider, that doesn't fill me with confidence that our Prime Minister is taking seriously the single most important political issue facing our country today. He is taking it seriously, and um, you will see uh, in the uh, you know, weeks and months ahead with the policy that we've got with our environment bill that puts uh, climate change at the heart of it. Climate change is a big feature of our future uh, agriculture policy. Um, this time, uh, later this year, uh, Glasgow is hosting a COP, and we've got lots of proposals yeah, on nature-based solutions. Claire left her post. She's the <coughs> one who said that Boris Johnson, I'm paraphrasing here, she didn't actually say this, doesn't give a stuff about climate no, change. I don't remember uh, saying exactly that. Paraphrasing. No. paraphrasing. Well, well, I think, Alice, I think you, she you, said that after she was replaced by somebody Alison else. Alison is, is, is smiling, but well, we're laughing really at this well, particular exchange. I mean, yes, basically, because um, the, the COP situation, the big summit, the global summit that we're supposed to be hosting, is it in Glasgow or is it in London? Who's the president of, president of it? We don't really know. It's a bit chaotic. And I think it says a huge amount about our prime minister that the collective decision of the government is that he's more use holed up in a country house somewhere than he is actually getting out there and offering a bit of support to people who are experiencing flooding. You know, I think the spirit of the question is, you know, shouldn't we be seeing a bit more of him? Don't people want a bit of reassurance that he's actually got his finger on the pulse? Okay. Michael, I'll come to you in a minute. I just want to get a little bit more from you. Yes, the woman in the front in the glass. Yeah. Um, the, the reason I'm asking is why have the EU stopped dredging the rivers, and then they wouldn't have flooded in the first place. Why the EU did, or why we did? Um, yeah, just why haven't they stopped why, dredging why? all these rivers across the country, and then we wouldn't have this problem? OK, the man here in the front of the section. Two points. One, the business rates relief. I don't know if any of the panel walked through Weymouth today. Yes, I did. Well, did you see all the empty shops? I mean, shouldn't the government cut business rates relief, for starters? That would help? The, sh the shops, you were saying about okay. business rates relief for those that just flooded. And secondly, what the gentleman there said about uh, HS2. If you got the Chinese to do the HS2, you'd be able to use your loose change to do all the flooding relief. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I sense the, uh, the mood of the country is that in all sorts of ways, we want enormous change. We just don't want things to be done the way they've been done in the past. Uh, and with the floods, it, it, it really is like... Groundhog Day. I mean, twice a year this happens, there's more floods. A minister comes on, says how much we've spent. Uh, people locally say, well, it's all been ineffective. Then we have a row about dredging the rivers and so on. I mean, it looks to me as though the Environment Agency has lost all public confidence. I think we really are at a stage where we want something, you know, bigger and different. We want something quite exceptional. Uh, a, a strategic look at how we're going to deal with this. And it can't surely just be about building defences so that we move the water further down river and a different lot of people get flooded. Surely what we need to do is think about how we can get the water from where it's arising, where it's falling, to the only place which is safe, which is the ocean. That's the only place where it doesn't affect other people. I just get, don't get any of that strategic feeling. And I think the comparison with HS2 is opposite in this respect. I, I'm in favour of HS2. But I do think we need you know, mega projects that are going to move the water to places wh where it's safe, rather than the, just this repeated effort of building a few defences here and there. The question, is about, the question is about Boris Johnson, who seems to be very good at coming to the House of Commons and making very enthusiastic speeches about trains or doing things or having energy. But when it actually comes to getting projects delivered, he seems to be pretty poor, actually. What did he fail to do in London? Golden the Golden Bridge. Bridge and yeah. Water it, cannon. And the island, it, he was going to have an airport on an <laughs> island. So we've had all of these great plans. I would just like had to see some practical Had you done a photo call this week, you two would action. be the leading critics. So one of the most surprising things I've ever heard is that Michael Portillo is in favour of investment in railways. That must be <laughs> <laughs> everyone. Okay. 
there is a point here that you have a cabinet for a reason. It's not a, a one-man show. And yeah. there are uh, issues like this, where the Prime Minister spoke to me uh, last Thursday, you know, two days, three days before the impacts of the flood started to come through. We discussed that this was coming up. We discussed what the plan would be. We stood up all of our emergency procedures. And we've had 1,000 EA staff out on the ground working hard, knocking on doors, warning people, helping to support communities. But there is another through. point to what Michael said as well, which is... You feel that there's a lack of strategic thinking. You've been in this department since 2013. You've been talking about floods since just after you started. Do you think, why are we still in this situation? It feels like well, Groundhog Day. I've well, been doing no, this for um, years. Well, no, because I can remember when I worked for David Cameron uh, many years ago now in 2007, uh, and there was a flood then, and there were 17,000 homes uh, flooded. Uh, this time, we've had a worse weather event. Uh, the land is already waterlogged, two consecutive storms. And uh, it's terrible. We've had you know, around 1,400 homes flooded. But were it not for the defences we built uh, over the last decade, uh, that, no that number would have been more like 25,000 homes. So <laughs> what we're doing is working, but there's always more uh, that we can do. And that's yeah. why we just need to continue investing in the future. OK, I'm going to move on to... And I'm trying to get as many questions in as I can tonight, because we had so many from you this evening. Let's take a question now from Maggie Stansfield. Should we continue to support the BBC as a universal public service broadcaster? <laughs> I don't know what that means, that sort of sigh, sort of noise in the room. I mean, Howard, I wanted to come to you first on this because you were part of the uh, charter review of the BBC, which is a review that happens periodically yeah. to work out how the BBC should be, how, how much money the BBC should be given, uh, if at all. And you were part of that review. And, 2004 and five, and it looked at the license fee. I think. Yes, is that right? uh, yes, it did. Uh, so the short answer to your question is, uh, I would say yes, personally. Uh, we looked at this 15 years ago and concluded the license fee is a funny thing in a way because it has several things against it. One is, of course, it's a poll tax. Uh, you know, the, so the rich pay the same as the not so rich, and that's you know, not normally the good way of taxing, really, because you'd like to have taxes which are progressive. So it's not good from that point of view. Um, and the only thing it had going for it at the time, well, two things, really. One was that actually people wanted it. <laughs> there, was a positive, there was a majority in favour of funding the BBC with a licence fee. So as economists, and, you know, we sat there sort of saying, well, why should we sit there and tell people they can't have what it is clear that they actually want, even if it's a slightly odd way of doing it? Now, what's changed now is that it's clear that only about a quarter of the population on recent opinion polls do favour the licence fee. And that, so that has been a change over the 15 years since I last looked at it uh, closely. So I think the, the question now has to be asked. The problem is that while the BBC appears on Freeview, it's not possible to determine who is watching the BBC at any one time and determine whether you can have a subscription service or not, because you're getting it through Freeview. I think in the long run, in 10 or 15 years' time, probably the BBC will have to move to some kind of a different funding model a subscription model when the technology is available to know exactly who is watching what and then you can charge them for appropriately for it. In the meantime, I have to say I would stick with the licence fee. Alison? Um, I reserve the right to, you know, criticise the BBC when it does things that I don't like and puts on programmes Feel free, that I don't like. Don't mind but, me. <laughs> but, yeah, but, um, but I think we all have to be a bit careful here because I think there's a ton of things that the BBC does that I can't see really a subscription service doing. I can't see anyone else doing. Most primary schools in the country watch Newsround now, um, which is absolutely brilliant. I can't see anybody you know, making that for them for free. Um, there's loads of programming that we all know of that is absolutely brilliant that the BBC does. So I think we have to be careful. You know, no, nobody should give the, the BBC, you know, a sort of free pass and we should engage in our national support, a national sport rather, of complaining about the telly and even <laughs> shouting at it. Um, I'm sure people do that this programme. Sure I know people, they do. <laughs> I'm sure people do, but I would just say let's all be a bit careful because the BBC is an incredible national institution, like the National Health Service. It's pretty unique for this country. And, um, and I just, I can't see a, I can't see a pay-for subscription service doing some of the things that the BBC does. Um, Michael, what do you, anyway, as a former Conservative Cabinet Minister, uh, Secretary of State, what do you make of these briefings that seem to be coming out of Number 10? We saw them in the papers at the weekend. 
Oh, <clears throat> do you mind if I answer the question, the main question? Because I... Okay, but will you do that one as well after? Yes, if you, if you like, although I, that's not an area of my expertise. But I, but I have to begin by declaring an interest because I derive most of my income from the licensed <laughs> payer. Fight the hands, Michael. <laughs> and, and therefore, you might be surprised when I say that I do not believe the licence fee can survive. Um, it is partly, actually, my experience of making films. I make films with very young people. And the young people with whom I make films do not pay the licence fee. They do not have televisions. They consume their media on their mobile phones or on their laptops. And since, I think it was about two years ago, when you went on your laptop to download to, to, on the iPlayer to catch up, it asked you whether you had a licence fee. You now have to answer that question, so they answer no. That blocks them out of the BBC. Therefore, these young people now have no connection with the BBC. They, they don't even watch the programmes they make with me because they have no access to the BBC. And the, and the BBC is losing its audience. And why? Because these people have any number of other opportunities to watch television and they consume it as they wish and when they wish. The other extraordinary thing is that when you're abroad, you cannot consume the BBC, or not BBC television anyway. Uh, so even though I paid the licence fee, when I go abroad, I'm blocked from watching the BBC. But I mean, don't forget, the licence fee is not just for television. No, what about no, no, it, indeed. It's, it's, well, it's, it's uh, all ra radio ra stations ra and, ra and online. Yes. And else. Uh, radio is a, is a different question and a much simpler question. But, but I also think that if we talk about television for the moment, there's not much evidence now on the BBC that it's performing a public service role. I don't think there's much evidence on BBC now that they're doing things that other people could not possibly do. I mean, for example, in arts, there's almost no arts programming now on BBC television. If you want to see uh, arts, you would watch uh, Sky Arts. So this combination... You know but, 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 but I wanted to come to the more important point that not only can British people not watch the BBC abroad when they pay their licence fee, foreigners can't consume the BBC directly either. And there are, you know, eight, nine billion people out there who would be very keen to consume the BBC. I mean, there if is there BBC was a way. World. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't keep B butting in, but B I'm just yeah. a, in the B interest of accuracy. B B B B BBC World is not a real channel. The BBC is not proud of BBC World, seriously. I, I think the people who work on BBC World are probably proud of BBC World. Okay. <laughs> I'm, not, right. I'm not sure okay. that they are. But the point <laughs> is, the point is that, you know, 20 years ago, Netflix was a corner shop renting videotapes. Today, it is spending $10 billion a year on content. 20 years ago, the BBC and was... And it's a... billions in debt, of but... course. 20 years ago, the BBC was a global name. Today, the BBC is wedded to the licence fee. It is like a polar bear on a receding piece of ice. OK. <laughs> but, um, hang on, I need to get the rest of the, the, the panel in. Uh, Ash? So, look, I've got, I've got really strong feelings about this. I think that the BBC needs to adapt or die, but it's not... It shouldn't adapt in the direction that, uh, you know, Dominic Cummings and his team at number 10 are angling for it to change, which is to, you know, privatise, commercialise and no longer be a licence-funded model. I think the way in which it needs to adapt is to first be established on a permanent statutory footing. So you don't have this brouhaha every 10 years over charter renewal in which the government of the day is able to exert a tremendous amount of political pressure by essentially holding the BBC's continuing existence hostage. I also think we need to look at things like a digital licence fee and also taxing some of these big digital multinationals like, you know, Netflix, like Facebook, like Google, which make tremendous amounts of money in this country. And I know that there are a lot of people on the left who are at the moment furious with the BBC for elements of its news and current affairs coverage during the general election. And I share a lot of those criticisms. But what I would say to those people on the left who are currently saying that they may as well support defunding the BBC on political grounds is that handing over the British broadcasting environment to Rupert Murdoch, which is what would happen if we no longer had a licence payer funded BBC is not a credible left-wing position. George, what's going on? Well, um, it's going what to be all a, it's going all to be briefings a, um, coming out. That we look, it's going see. to be a licence um, fee model until at least 2027. So nothing is being done in a hurry uh, anyway. The BBC is a cherished uh, institution, there's no doubt about that. But I think both Michael and Had have made um, good points, which is just see how media has changed over the last decade, uh, with people now getting their content from smartphones, from iPads. You know, imagine what's going to happen just in the next seven years. So it's appropriate, in my view, to think 
about what the funding model should be and how best you should um, raise money to fund the BBC, because it can't make sense long term to still have a licence fee based on a sort of conventional televisions that we've, uh, you know, grew up with in, in the sort of, you know, 60s and 70s. At some point, uh, the model will need to change to reflect the changing way that people are receiving their content. And do you think public service broadcasting is possible under a, under a different model? Does that even matter, do you think? Um, but I personally think it does, yes. I think there is a, uh, an important role for public service broadcasting, and this is where the difficulty comes, is how do you, uh, how do you fund that, I suppose, on a subscription-only um, uh, subscription service? So, but these are complex, difficult issues, and that's why nothing is being done uh, in a hurry. Indeed, nothing much is going to change until 2027, which is when uh, the, the licence fee model continues to, at the very least. So okay. what's with all the sabre-rattling coming from your government, then? talking about that the licence fee is under threat. Why do that if it's not a big hurry to change things? Well, is it just to exert a bit of influence over the appointment of the next Director-General? Uh, I've not seen, personally, any sabre rattling. Seen I've seen... Uh, well, it's been all papers. over the papers, front page of the Sunday Times. I've learned not to believe Come everything on, you see George. in papers. I mean, no one's going to believe that. Reading. You're reading the papers. <laughs> could I... Um, well, I, I, don't, I don't believe everything I read in the papers, yeah. is what I'm saying. Um, could, could I, just I never say, have. I mean, Howard's referred to looking at things over 10 to 15 years, and George has just said... Uh, everything's going to be the same until 2027. I don't think either one of you has an idea of how quickly this picture is changing. And I'm deeply depressed by both those answers. I think the BBC may be in very serious difficulty if we wait until 2027 before we decide on a different model for how the BBC can be carried forward, not just as a means for us to watch television, but as a means of taking the wonders of the BBC to the world, which at the moment are not available in a modern form. That is to say, they're not available to the individual who wants to buy a BBC programme at the moment that he or she chooses to watch it. We've got very little time left, but you've had your hand up quite some time, so you may end up having the last word. Right, I, I just think the BBC is a national institution that we are all proud of, and I don't think anybody should be worrying about paying that licence fee. It's incredibly good value. What I think is the problem is what are we spending that money on? How much do we, do we pay our presenters? I'm not asking this to you, Fiona, but <laughs> if, if, we're paying, if we're paying six and seven figure um, salaries to, to TV presenters, what does that actually say, coming back to the lady's first question of tonight? The people that we value in this country, the people that are doing really hard jobs day in, day out for a pittance, why is that money going to pay people to do something here? Well, actually, I think anybody in the audience could get up and present a programme brilliantly as well. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being now controversial. It's fighting tour. If you want me to, to take me over, Michael. I'll do it for you next week, if you like. OK, watch I'll this space. <laughs> watch this space, OK. That's where you get the money. Well, listen, money. on that bombshell, I won't be sitting here next week. What's your name? Michael. Michael. Michael will be sitting here next week. <laughs> Our hour is up just as well. Uh, next week, we're in Middlesbrough and the following week we are in Tunbridge Wells in Kent. So call 0330 if you'd like to be in the audience or if you'd like to sit here, who knows, present train programmes um, or you can go to the Question Time website and follow the instructions there. And if you want to have your say, continue this conversation on tonight's topics, you can, as always, join Adrian Charles and guests on Question Time Extra Time and that is on Five Live now. But for now, thank you very much to the panel, to Michael, to the audience here, of course, and to you at home for watching and listening from Weymouth. Bye-bye. While making sense of all that election terminology, John Sopel and Emily Maitlis present AmeriCast. You can listen to it now through BBC Sense.